the COVID-19 pandemic has united the world in common concern, it has also exposed fault lines between rich and poor countries and magnified the inequalities in the world system and structures of global power. The two main concerns for most societies worldwide are, first, how to mitigate the health impact of the virus and limit the number of fatalities and pressure on the public health infrastructure, and second, how to mitigate the economic catastrophe that has resulted from the measures to address the first concern. For societies in developing countries, the latter is a far more pressing concern, despite the widespread consensus that many of the precautionary measures are necessary. The pandemic has exposed the absurdity of national priorities and the fragility of the international economic system. Rich countries cannot escape the economic or health crises, but can use money to address at least some aspects of their problems, as evidenced by the large spending bills in countries such as the United States, Germany, or the United Kingdom. For many developing countries, however, there is much less scope for spending, despite the necessity of mitigating the worst ravages of the pandemic and economic crisis on issues of food security, debt financing, public welfare, and human development. International cooperation can help expand investment in research and interventions to counter negative socioeconomic spillover. But beyond these concerns, there are broader questions to address. For instance, what kind of political economy will emerge in the coming years? And how will the narrative about the economic, political, and social response be shaped? Welcome to Security in Context, a podcast aimed at promoting new thinking on security from a global perspective. I'm your host, Anita Fuentes, and today we are diving into a topic of global importance the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19, paying special attention to North-South inequalities. With the help of our guests, we will investigate the ways in which the pandemic has affected different areas of the world, such as Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Middle East North Africa region. Our guests today will include Mark Weisbrot, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, Merina Zalawadi, leader of the Gender, Justice, Population and Inclusive Development Cluster at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, and Julio Gambina, Professor of Political Economics at the National University of Rosario and member of the Partner Research Network, CLACSO. The episode will end with a conversation between Omar Dahi, our founding director and professor of economics at Hampshire College, and Farad Demir, founding member of Security in Context and professor of economics at the University of Oklahoma. Last month, we hosted a discussion with Mark Weisbrot about the International Monetary Fund and how billions of people could benefit from a simple costless act of Congress. This conversation which you can watch on Security in Context YouTube channel, was followed by an interview conducted by Security in Context's Omar Dahi, focused on economic sanctions on Venezuela. We asked Mark Weisbrot about the main findings of the 2019 research report he co-authored with Columbia University professor Jeffrey Sachs, titled Economic Sanctions as Collective Punishment, the Case of Venezuela. We were interested in exploring the impact of economic warfare by the global north and the United States in particular against global south countries, in this case, economic sanctions against Venezuela. Mark Weisbrod helped us place the role of economic sanctions within the overall framework of US foreign policy, and more broadly, the joint policy between the US and its allies. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my first question to you is, what made you write uh, this article with Professor Sachs, and what were some of your main findings? I think the first thing, though, the one that, that got the most news was the mortality. Uh, and I think it's the most important, is how many people die as a result of sanctions like this. And so 
it just so happened, you know, there wasn't any government, recent government mortality uh, data. These sanctions we were starting with began in 2017, and this was 2019 we were writing. And then there were more sanctions in 2019. And there wasn't any... Uh, there wasn't any mortality data in that time, except there was a group uh, that was run by a couple of university departments. They, you know, a university run a study of mortality, a survey of mort mortality. And uh, it was an opposition group. And this is a good example of how information gets uh, distorted because they didn't release their data. And we only got it because they gave it to the United Nations confidentially, and then the United Nations published it. I think they weren't supposed to. It's pretty clear they weren't supposed to, but they published it, and nobody denied that this was the real data that they gathered, and that it was a survey. And it showed an increase of uh, a 31% 31, 31 increase in mortality for the year from uh, 2017 to 18. And I don't even think this included the whole period of the sanctions, but it was a number. And, and so that was 40,000 uh, people. And, you know, this was, obviously there were other things going on, but when we looked at everything else, it was clear that uh, this was the best explanation of at least tens of thousands of deaths that uh, the increase in deaths that, that happened. And then the group uh, is called Encovi. They never published the survey because, you know, it looked terrible for the sanctions. And uh, and then they never published. They were doing one at the time. They didn't publish the next year. And I don't think, I don't know if they ever published another one since. So uh, this is the problem. You know, you don't even get the information unless uh, you you really look for it or, or do the, the work yourself. And... So that was that was the biggest thing. And then we looked at, you know, how that could be. And it was kind of obvious why it did so much damage. I mean, if you just think of how much they lost in imports, you see, in, in because Venezuela depends on oil for its export revenue. It barely exported anything else at the time, you know, before the sanctions hit. I think over 90 percent of their exports were oil. So what it did, what these sanctions did, is they really destroyed the oil industry. In fact, from Cisco Rodriguez, who, you know, probably the leading expert on the Venezuelan economy, he's estimated that they've lost 17 billion now in the four years uh, due to these sanctions. At this time, we did the paper; it was probably around six billion. And you know, just to give a, a comparison, you know, the total uh, medicine imports for that year. Uh, were uh, about two and a half billion. So uh, you you just you take away the country's ability to import, and it destroys uh, the economy. In fact, the most recent numbers I think from the IMF show that the economy has uh, fallen by uh, seventy five percent. Um, I think in the last uh, four years, and. That's really incredible. Uh, you know, that's, you know, there's very, there's almost no examples of that in history without an actual war. So you're really talking about the destruction of an economy and the destruction of people's uh, means of survival. And of course, uh, essential medicines, water, water infrastructure. Yes, it always actually strikes me as bizarre that some of these countries are criticized as being rentier economies. And then also there's a turnaround. And when you sanction them and block them from exporting their major source of rent, uh, the U.S. turns around and says that it's not the sanctions that is the cause of this, but uh, the government's mismanagement. So it's almost like you're trying to maintain two mutually exclusive uh, narratives about the country um, at the same time. Can you... Tell us a little bit the legal framework or the legality of, of these sanctions. You you mentioned that a little bit earlier in terms of uh, how we can understand uh, them, you know, in in the framework of the OAS, which is discussed in the paper, or international law. 
Yes, this is very important because I think ultimately the way this is going to change is the Congress is going to do something because the executive, you know, is is just completely unaccountable in this country on, on anything that has to do with foreign policy. And so uh, the, and this is supposedly foreign policy, you know, this is another legal, legal aspect of it. In order to implement these sanctions, uh, the president has to declare, and Obama did this first in 2015, uh, and then uh, Trump again in 2017, and Biden had to continue it because he decided to continue the sanctions. They issue an executive order and they have to declare in this executive order that Venezuela is a an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security of the United States. And of course, you know, I mean, in North Korea, they say, well, they have nuclear weapons or Iran, they could claim that they're going to, you know, these were far-fetched arguments anyway, because none of these countries could ever build anything that could reach the United States. But in any case, here you have a country that doesn't have, there's no possible security threat from Venezuela. Everybody knows it. In fact, I've never even seen them forced to make the case <laughs> that Venezuela was it. But that, that's in the executive order. They have to say that. And the reason that's in the executive order is because you're not supposed to do this, right? Uh, and there are laws and treaties that we sign. So, so that, that's the excuse. You have to have this real uh, life and death kind of excuse for doing this. And, you know, you have the OAS charter, which prohibits this, which we're a signatory to. And you have the Geneva Conventions, which this is interesting. Now, the Geneva Conventions prohibit collective punishment where you're attacking the civilian population, which is what these sanctions do. They're mostly killing civilians. And uh, in, in order to, but the, the only reason that they're not guilty of an actual war crime is because the Geneva Conventions only apply during war. So it's a technicality. If there's no war going on, then you can't violate the Geneva Convention technically. But the United Nations has had a, a couple of publications and they, they've they said, you know, uh, it's pretty clear that something that's a crime when people are shooting at each other and, and bombing each other, you know, it ought to be a crime when you do the same thing uh, without that kind of a shooting war going on. So I think, again, this is a really important part. This is really a, uh, a crime of enormous magnitude when you actually target the civilian population. And here's the interesting thing is that it, they really did target the population. Pompeo, uh, the Secretary of State under Trump, to admit this in, in uh, 2019, uh, February, I think it was, he did an interview with CBS News and he said, uh, and he was talking about Iran, and he said, things are much worse for the Iranian people with the U.S. sanctions, and we are convinced that will lead the Iranian people to rise up and change the behavior of the regime, which he means overthrow the government. And he said, he made a very similar statement, which we quoted in our paper, uh, for Venezuela in, in, to the news again. Uh, and so he's acknowledging that the real strategy is to make it so people feel they have to overthrow the government just to save their lives. And that is the strategy of these, uh, these sanctions. Um, you know, you could argue that some of the individual sanctions, if you have sanctioned individuals, uh, are not uh, directed in this way. But the ones that really, these really target the civilian population. And I just want to say uh, one more thing about that, because it isn't, you, know, you might think, oh, that's just Pompeo. But you do have people on the other side of this. So you have uh, Jim McGovern, who's uh, represented from Massachusetts, and he's a House leadership. He's a uh, the chair of the House, a very powerful position, the chair of the Rules Committee. And he wrote a letter to Biden in May of this year. And I want to just quote from that because he says something similar. He says, unlike sanctions that target the behavior of specific individuals, 
the impact of sectoral and secondary sanctions, that's the kind of sanctions they have on Venezuela and Iran, is indiscriminate and purposely so. And he says, although U.S. officials regularly say that the sanctions target the government and not the people, the whole point of the quote-unquote maximum pressure campaign is to increase the economic cost to Venezuela of failing to comply with the conditions the U.S. imposes. Economic pain is the main means by which the sanctions are supposed to work. And he's against it. He's asking, uh, you know, he's arguing that the that these sanctions should be lifted. The only thing he doesn't say is that they're really killing people, but he knows that too. And often these discussions about sanctions or other measures are usually pretty siloed or they're taken in in isolation from one another uh, between countries or even within different actions that the U.S. might take towards the same country. But how would you place sanctions within the overall framework of U.S. foreign policy or U.S. and its allies' uh, foreign policy? Where would you situate the sanctions role? This is a question that is crucial to, I think, understanding the international, both the international economic and political order. And this is because the sanctions are a means by which the United States imposes its will on other countries. Now, it does this through warfare as well, right? You had Iraq and you have you know, all these uh, threats against the sanctions uh, countries, and you've had a lot of other uh, military actions even in recent years. But the sanctions, I would argue that the sanctions are actually more violent right now and probably for most of the past decade at least it's more violence is committed uh by in the sanctions more people are killed uh by the sanctions than these wars that certainly the drone strikes you know that's a good example that drone strike uh, was about a month ago in afghanistan it killed like seven children and i don't know how many people total maybe it was like 12 and you know that got some some press and that was, uh, you know, that was terrible in my view, and uh, it, it could possibly be considered a, a war crime even. But it was, I think you could make an argument that it was collateral damage, that is that they didn't actually target the children. So the sanctions are actually uh, arguably morally worse than the collateral damage of the civilians killed uh, because, first of all, it's so much more. Uh, so many more people are killed by sanctions, you know, except for the big wars. I'm I'm looking at, you know, so I'm looking at the last 10 years or so. We didn't have the Iraq war. Uh, and also because it is intentional. It's an intentional attack on the civilian population, exactly what, you know, the Geneva Conventions considered to be a war crime if it was done during war. So this is the kind of so this is where it fits in in our foreign policy. It's, you know, the old expression of, you know, a war is the continuation of politics by other means. Well, that's what this is. This is a, a, it's war by other means. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. The economic sanctions imposed on countries such as Venezuela or Iran, combined with a global pandemic, have of course resulted in countless deaths and huge damage to economies that were already suffering before COVID. In addition to our conversation with Mark Weisbrot about the sanctions, we were interested in exploring the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 from different angles. In order to get a diversity of perspectives, we invited Merina Zalawadi and Julio Ambina to join the discussion. Merina Zalawadi, is the leader of the Gender Justice Population and Inclusive Development Cluster at ESQUA. Prior to her career as an international civil servant, she was the Youth and Women Regional Advisor for Save the Children, and she worked for several international development organizations. Julio Gambina is a professor of political economy at the National University of Rosario. He's also a member of the steering committee at Claxo the Latin American Council for Social Sciences, president of FISIP, the Foundation of Social and Political Research, and director of IEFCTA, the Central Federation of Argentine Workers Institute for Studies and Training. 
The first question we posed to our guests was how they perceived the response to COVID-19, both globally and, more specifically, in Latin America and the MENA region. Well, at the economic level, the largest impact has been on employment and wages. The International Labour Organization, for example, suggests that hours of work have been lost due to the deliberate shutdown assumed by the states, and says that lost hours are equivalent to 255 million full-time jobs. The impact on employment has been quite severe because, in addition, many of the hours lost reflect lower wages, not all, but a good number of them. Regardless, there have been many workers globally who lost their jobs. So the result in terms of employment and wages ends up increasing problems of impoverishment in the population. There isn't a single international organization that doesn't indicate that the impact is a higher level of poverty. And, interestingly, at the same time, the concentration of income has increased because there have been sectors of the economy, as is the case of pharmaceutical laboratories that significantly have seen large increases in profit. Anyways, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America indicates that this past decade has been aggravated by COVID-19, a lost decade for Latin America in terms of combating poverty. I mean, poverty has increased worldwide. And now, in 2021, China has announced the elimination of extreme poverty. That's an achievement in a country that isn't reflected in general data. So the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been a very strong one on the global economy as a whole. And I insist, mainly in terms of health and the economy. Impoverished sectors are most affected and within them, those who experience multiple forms of discrimination. So we've estimated that the Arab region is going to lose at least $42 billion as a result of COVID. This is mainly due to the measures taken to mitigate the impact of COVID, including like uh, the lockdown, closing malls, airports, restaurants, and all the lockdown measures that we've seen across countries. And of course, this has resulted in a dramatic decrease in oil prices amounting to about $11 billion and losing about at least 1.7 million jobs. Uh, poverty rates had also increased tremendously. We've estimated that at least 16 new million people uh, have fell into poverty. And of course, there are the, uh, differences among countries. M more countries have been uh, hit harder by the pandemic uh, compared to others. Uh, what we've seen is also that COVID-19 had deepened the pre-existing inequalities exposing, uh, I would say, the extent of exclusion for some people like elderly and persons with disability and migrants. It's also more severe when it comes to people who are, for example, older people and at the same time suffering from disability because we know that 46% of older people in the Arab region and in the world age 60 above have one kind of disability. So those were hit even stronger. Within that broader approach of the social and economic consequences of the pandemic, we asked our guests to discuss some of the issues that COVID has raised in terms of gender equality. Julio approached this issue from a global perspective, touching upon matters such as the increase of unpaid domestic and care work, the difficulties of some women to comply with the confinement measures, the downsides to remote work, and the further aggravation of these socioeconomic impacts of women around the world from an intersectional approach. The consequences of COVID were, indeed, much worse for some women than for others, depending on a number of factors such as race, class, nationality, geographic location, age, profession, family situation, and so many more. Discrimination towards women who have had to intensify their labor in the production and reproduction of everyday life, in care work, in domestic work, it's sharpened and aggravated in impoverished populations. Women who live in marginalized areas, in areas without access to services, and who don't have stable incomes, they have found themselves in an enormously complicated situation 
in balancing working for wages with caring for children, um, the elderly, social solidarity work. And for that reason, the pandemic aggravated this discrimination. Under the quarantine measures that the majority of governments took, there were entire populations that couldn't submit or comply with the confinement rules that quarantines involved. But including in the formal labor market, uh, remote work policies, telework, work from a distance became widespread, um, which fueled discrimination because, of course, women were at home. If before they split productive labor time between work in an office, in a workplace, and at care work at home, well, now they had to contend with dual work in the same space. And the house isn't prepared to separate the environments of care, of the family, domestic activity, with the environment of wage labor. Many households only have one computer or telephone with the ability to carry out the task of remote work, and therefore women had to share those devices with other household members, including children, when educational development also moved into the home. Um, therefore, the issue of discrimination against women really expressed itself in new forms of contracting home-based work, an issue that is notorious in the case of educational work. But it also applies to administrative workers, government work. It seems that this is a recurring theme. And uh, interestingly enough, it has an extreme economic impact because, well, in your words, female workers and workers in general had to buy the means of production, the technical equipment and the tools. Interestingly enough, when capitalism was born, it was born on the basis of the dispossession of workers from the means of production. And today we have returned to business offloading that cost of production directly onto workers, both men and women. We must keep in mind the lack of internet connection because you can't just have a cell phone or a computer, you also need connection. And not just connection to the internet, but also to electricity. Um, not all homes have access to electricity, to the internet, and this has increased inequalities. I would even go so far as to say inequality among women themselves, because not every woman, well, all women face discrimination in general, but the most impoverished women are particularly discriminated against. Interestingly, this is at the very moment in which the fight for women's rights, for gender equality, has globally become more visible. The remarkable thing is that the coronavirus has come to stall the process of huge cultural advances that the various feminist movements have generated in the fight for gender equality. But these economic and sanitary impacts of COVID-19, they've had a particularly negative impact on discrimination towards women. Dr. Alawadi, on the other hand, gave us some insights on the ways in which the pandemic hit women in the MENA region specifically. Women have uh, disproportionate taken over the load of the pandemic and the consequences compared to men. But in order to come to this conclusion, we need to also look at the situation of women prior to COVID, which was already fragile. So, uh, 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 for example, the Gender Development Index, I would say in the Arab region, had scored something around 0.8 which is below the world average, 0.9. So we were already lagging behind. Also, according to the World Economic Forum, you have women in the Middle East and North Africa have consistently scored the lowest among the other regions in the world. So what I'm trying to say here is that even prior to the pandemic, which is very important as a starting point, women were coming from a fragile uh, situation. And then came the pandemic. When the pandemic came, women borne the burden of care for elderly and family members because by nature in, the, in this region, women already spend about uh, 4.7 more time in unpaid work compared to men, which is again, the highest globally. Meeting all the pregnancy needs, the labor, the childbirth, postpartum needs was very challenging during the pandemic for women to have access to these kinds of services due to the inability of hospitals and clinics to provide such services, also due to the lockdown or the limited resources, which were all shifted to fight the pandemic. 
We've also estimated that uh, women have lost about 700,000 jobs in 2020. And this is mainly because women were working in the informal sector that was hit harder by the pandemic. Some of the industrial sector in the region that were hit more are like uh, things like manufacturing and the service industries. And these are where most women worked. And these were hit harder. So you have, I would say, sectors that where women were concentrated and they were so much hit by the pandemic. Lastly, violence against women had increased tremendously due to the lockdown and inavailability of services uh, for women to reach out to. And maybe one more thing I could highlight is that women's access to computers and information about the pandemic also was gendered because not all women are computer literate or have access to internet. During the course of 2019, three different teams from the University of Oklahoma and West Virginia University worked with partner grassroots women's organizations and Akoli translators to interview 247 rural women in northern Uganda. These comprehensive interviews resulted in the baseline survey of women's grassroots organizations. The survey, which included major findings, was shared digitally with partners during the fall of 2020. Faculty from the University of Oklahoma and West Virginia University intended to present the findings during a meeting with partner organizations, but the meeting was disrupted due to COVID-19 and resultant travel bans and restrictions. In September 2021, a member of the original research team was given permission to travel to Uganda from the US in order to share the report and to engage in frank conversations about the impact of COVID on the lives of the women originally interviewed and on the work of their organizations. The meeting took place at St. Monica's Girls Tailoring School in Gulu, Uganda. Can you guys say something? Hi. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Hello. You're most welcome. Thank you for taking these photos with us. So the first question is, um, are you okay with this video being on the um, website for the Center for Peace and Development? There's no problem. Yes, it's okay. Yes. Thank you, baby. Okay, I'm glad. Perfect. <laughs> this really is nice. Um, can you both state your names? Can you start first? Tell, tell everyone your name. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Chano Gorafadi Gladys, the Executive Director of Kirkum Women Peace Institute, a local organization in Kirkum District. Okay. Thank you. I'm Kakanyoro Brenda Claudia from Kirkum Women Peace Initiative. I work as a program officer, gender. I am Amo and Evelyn. Okay, very good. What's the name of your organization? My organization is called Women Advocacy Network. Okay, Women's Advocacy Network. How long has it been around? Uh, since 2011. 2011, okay. Mm. My name is Awar Catherine. Mm. I, I come from Lira, from an, a grassroots organization called Lao Women Peace and Development Champions, although we are rebranding it to Forum instead of charity. Can you tell um, a little bit about your organization, uh, specifically the mission of the organization? Mm, the mission of the organization is to promote peace building and uh, meaning, meaningful women participation on women peace and security agenda. Hmm. Aware that uh, during armed conflict, the most affected persons are women, hmm. and this affects them differently. Uh, when we talk about the human security, it, it talks about uh, uh, the reproductive health issues they face, they face gynecological problem, and they face very many uh, problems. Mm. So, as women that passed through armed conflict, they went through very many things, and therefore, as organization, we look at promoting peace building and meaningful participation of women to all their dignity yes. and the rights. Right now I have nine, 970 women who come back from the booth. Okay. 
Can you just talk about like what made you start the Women's Advocacy Network? One, I want the world to know wars, but war is make people die every day. War throw our life. We lost our right. We lost our education. We miss our parents. We lost our parents about war. That way I need well to know that war must stop. Taking women to the bush is not good. Mm -hmm. We suffer a lot from the bush. Mm. We come back with children. We are still suffer with them. Mm. The mission for this organization basically is that through awareness creation, through trainings, and uh, a different types of training like on income generating, uh, awareness creation on different issues that affect women and girls, uh, and even the general community at large. Uh, we are trying to help them to see how they can, um, they can uh, develop in order to address, I mean, in order to address conflicts that arise as a result of lack of development. Can you talk about some of the programs yeah. that you've done over the years with the women? Since the inception of the organization, we have conducted very many activities. And one of which I can proudly talk about is that we did the reconstruction and rehabilitation of women affected by conflict that have come back from captivity, yeah. building their confidence and restoring their hope. Yeah. Because most of them have already lost hope. They, they, they think they were not useful in the society. Yeah. But because there were some people to provide the hope, yeah. we managed to give them that hope. We managed to put the smile in their face. So that was the, uh, like emergency response. Uh, we look. We also went ahead to provide medication mm. because some of these girls and women that come came back from captivity mm. uh, were uh, infected by HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. So we had to go on counseling them, providing psychosocial support services, trauma management to ensure that they heal mentally mm. and physically, mm -hmm. so that they are able to uh, join the community and participate in community work to be independent. Mm. We continue to provide life skills and education skills to them mm. because most of these women and girls were uh, abducted at tender age, mm. some were abducted at six and came back mm. at 16 with three, four children. Mm. Some were abducted at eight, came back at 23 with four, five children. Mm and they have lost the chance of going back to school. Mm. So the only hope that we had to provide them was to provide therapy, mm. as well as to provide the life skills, education skills, mm. and part of a vocational skills, mm. which help them to grow independently, to economically mm. gain some viable income mm. to sustain them as part of the income generating activities. Um, the kind of collaborative efforts that we really want from uh, different partners is, first of all, we, we would love if we can get some fundings mm -hmm. for our activities. Because basically, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, due to uh, underly so many underlying conditions, we have been able to, we have not been able to get enough money to meet the demands mm. of the community. Mm. And to make matters worse, our biggest donors used to come from the West, mm. uh, but the West was also affected by the credit crunch. Mm. And before they could recover from the credit crunch, then there is this global COVID, yes. which has also greatly affected people. Yes. And uh, uh, we think uh, if we, we, we can fundraise, mm. we shall be able to achieve what we, we really plan to. Economic and livelihood, because you cannot eat peace. Yes. That is what people yes. were telling us. Yes. Amidst the training, amidst the yes. education, amidst the sensitization, you yes. talk of peace building, but yes. they can't eat mm. that. Mm -mm. So as we uh, educate them, on conflict management, mm. on conflict transformation. Mm. They should also be help supported mm -hmm. to have income generating activity, mm -hmm. to have 
uh, activities that can generate funds right. to meet their basic needs, yes. like the medication, yes. the education, yes. the shelter, yes. the clothing. Yes. So this is what we have been providing Maybe. to these girls because we need to empower our women. Yes. Our women do so much work mm -hmm. and paid care work. Yes. It's yes. too much. Yes. Eh? yes. You see, a woman goes to office, a woman work in the office, a woman comes back to care for a baby, yes. to care for the sick child, yes. to care for the sick husband. Yes. Those ones are unpaid for. Right. But in most cases, you find that most of the work done by men mm. are paid work. Yes. And as a result, women become vulnerable because they take too much unpaid care work yes. amidst those that they are contributing to change the society. What we really want, uh, I mean, uh, collaboration with people from outside is about exchange visits. Yes. More especially if they can come and visit us. Because you know, the, the, the women whom we work with, their mentality is that like a white person is superior. So basically, we want them to know that really they should not be so dependent on the white, on the white, because the white people have worked for what they have, and we should be able to also work so that we support ourselves. What is it that we can do ourselves? Eh? When the video is, I'm going to send it to John mm. and Farat and the video people. Mm. They will edit the video. Mm. We will send it to you, mm. and you will be able to look at it before anything goes online. Another issue of interest within the discussion of COVID socioeconomic impacts is the mechanisms through which the already existing inequalities between the global north and the global south were and are being accentuated. In this context, we asked our guests to reflect on the ways in which the global north is blocking or choosing not to pursue policies that could have a significant impact on an effective response by the global south to the pandemic and the role of international organizations in the response to COVID. Geographic discrimination has accelerated, has been aggravated between capitalist, developed countries and impoverished countries. I say impoverished, not poor, because Africa, Asia, Latin America, they're regions with wealth in the commons, in social potential, but, well, they've been plundered by the world. And the pandemic, without a doubt, worsened the quality of life in those regions. On the other hand, developed countries like the United States, Europe, Japan, their governments have a greater financial capacity and a larger sanitary infrastructure and a developed human potential to better confront the pandemic and its consequences. And what does this reflect? A greater capacity to spend money and issue debt. For example, established hospital capacity, or the potential to buy and accumulate vaccines. In some cases, vaccines that were appropriated and accumulated by these countries with purchasing power expired, while other countries in the global system had no power to buy vaccines at all. Yes, well, the biggest thing I think right now is the, what you know, people are calling vaccine apartheid, that is the United States is um, actually, and its allies, you know, its high-income country allies, they're blocking the developing countries from manufacturing their own vaccines, and they've been doing this for a while. And earlier this year, there was a resolution uh, that uh, South Africa and India introduced in the World Trade Organization to say that this knowledge should be shared and that the intellectual property which is a major part of the rules of the WTO, should be suspended uh, for the pandemic so that uh, this could be done. And you need more than that, too. I mean, you need the, the U.S. government, which has the right to do this, too, to, uh, to share, and the European governments to share the actual knowledge that is needed to make vaccines in other parts. And there's plenty of countries that could do it. And they're not allowing it. They haven't uh, allowed it. 
uh, and the United States uh, blocked it in the World Trade Organization. But then Biden came under pressure, so he said, "No, I'm, I'm okay with it." And then Germany carries the ball for the rich countries. And that's the other part of the the last question that you asked is that you have an alliance of these rich countries, uh, high income countries, against the rest of the world. You know, or I should say, the governments and corporations, and then especially in the pharmaceutical case, it's really driven by the corporations, but it's not always, you know, most of it's about power. And they have a certain uh, strategy, which is not in our interest in the United States, the majority of people, but in terms of our government, they see their goal in these power terms. And so, for example, they control uh, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, they wrote the rules uh, for the World Trade Organization. They control the Inter-American Development Bank. These so-called institutions of global governance are co controlled by a handful of countries. And when I say controlled, I mean really controlled. Mira, terminan agravando las, uh, International organizations end up aggravating discriminatory conditions, conditions of inequity and inequality. For example, the International Monetary Fund in each global economic crisis since its inception, has intervened by allocating special drawing rights, which are an asset that the monetary fund makes available to member countries, and it distributes these special drawing rights according to each country's share in the International Monetary Fund. So now it's set up a huge program of about $650 million to allocate these special drawing rights to deal with the effect, the economic impact, on these countries. But, of course, it's distributed in greater proportion to the countries that contribute more capital to the International Monetary Fund, which is the case for the United States, European countries, and therefore aid isn't distributed to every country, but discriminates on the basis of economic power. Of course, at the same time, the fund says we insist that countries who don't use their special drawing rights can redirect them towards a distribution fund for impoverished countries. But in practice, that doesn't happen. I'll even give you a very simple example to consider. As is the case for Argentina, a member country of the International Monetary Fund strongly indebted to the Monetary Fund and which received the equivalent of four and a half million dollars in special drawing rights, which Argentina is using to make debt repayments to the monetary fund itself. Loans that were granted in 2018, before the pandemic existed, and which haven't served to improve Argentina's public health, education, or infrastructure, and are strongly associated with the outflow of capital from the country. What I want to say, in synthesis, is that international organizations seem concerned, seemed concerned with the pandemic situation, but they didn't act accordingly to remedy the negative and regressive effects, the increase of inequality. You mentioned the special drawing rights, which is a very good example on, on the other side where they actually did something right. But what happened? I mean, the managing director of the IMF uh, made a speech in March of uh, of 2020, uh, you know, saying the world needed, developing world needed like trillions of dollars worth of these SDRs. And uh, the House of Representatives, uh, and, you know, I was uh, part of this because of, there were over 100 organizations that went to the House and asked them to do something. And, and because as soon as she made that speech, um, the Trump administration vetoed it at the IMF, which shows you like what they can do. They just said no. And, you know, there's uh, at least 180 something out of 190 countries wanted the SDRs and they just said no. And so and then the uh, Congress passed it. And of course, Republicans vetoed it in the Senate and there's still the legislation now in the House. But my point is that this is part of the world order that and there's nothing conspiratorial about it. I mean, you can see the, you can just look it up on the web. I mean, 60% of the votes belong to, in the IMF, belong to the United States and uh, and their high income country allies. And so they don't even bother to vote almost. It's, it's very infrequent that they actually, the executive board actually has to vote on anything.
and and that's the most powerful of the international uh, the multilateral organizations. And so they use this power together to keep, in many ways, I mean, it's not always their direct intention, but the impact of it is to prevent a lot of development in the in the developing world. And of course, in the more extreme cases, to uh, it has an enormous uh, human cost when they decide to impose sanctions or bomb people or go to war. But although in some cases, international organizations were complicit in perpetuating North-South inequalities, our guests also highlighted some success stories and good practices carried out by governments and organizations. I would say that each country had done something that is uh, unique and each country had a success story. So you had countries that worked on unifying, for example, their social registry systems to ensure synergies and coordination in social protection program. And that was done for the first time. You had countries that were able to identify the new poor. And this is what we have called those who have newly fallen into poverty. You have uh, countries that were able to expand horizontally and vertically the social assistance program that they're offering. And what was unique also about many of the countries is their ability to utilize technology to reach to the most vulnerable groups in the society. And that was through sending, for example, messages on mobile, asking people to register to the programs that the government are offering. Again, the way countries have expanded their social protection schemes was amazing to see how they were able to identify the people, reach out to them, provide them with money. And the amount of funds that was put into that was amazing. One of the things that ESQUA had done and done that quickly because time was very essential to the response that we have done to Arab states, for example, is the development of a tracker, global tracker, that covers 190 countries. And this shows the uh, stimulus packages that all these countries have done either on social protection or fiscal uh, policies and measures as well. And that had allowed a lot of exchange of knowledge and learning among countries. We have also developed a lot and quickly policy briefs to provide a lot of estimate and projections on the impact of uh, COVID on different sectors. Uh, if it is food security, poverty, employment, gender equality, violence. And these were so much alarming and useful at the same time for countries to understand the extent of the problem of COVID. We also have at ESQA, I would say, the convening power of bringing in Arab states together. And we have done that several times through intergovernmental meetings that at ESQA we have uh, as, I, as I said, the convening power to bring them all uh, together. And of course, we've done a lot of capacity development activities to help countries build their uh, social protection systems, the registry system, turn it into an online and automated uh, system to help them identify errors and identify the new poor and all that. I'd say that the biggest success has been in state-led action and planning. Of course, there have been countries that had a state apparatus and planning capacity in the position to carry forward measures to deal with the pandemic, and other countries with the potential to implement a state-led response, as with the United States. Well, there were contradictions between U.S. federal power and state governments with more limited jurisdiction that contradicted the national strategy. Something similar happened in Brazil and in Great Britain. But in global terms, I think that it's state planning and the role the state takes. Curiously, in the last 40 years, the state has faced a lot of criticism. And when the pandemic started, everything, at every level, businesses, workers, obviously, diverse economic groups, everyone came forward to call for state intervention, and the state intervened, including investing financially, including taking out loans. Let's say that it's become clear that the role of the state is very important. And one last thing I'd like to mention regarding this last question is that the pandemic has to be a wake-up call to humanity in its various impacts on production, on its effects on nature, on society as a whole. 
The truth is that in these times, international cooperation didn't exist as a norm. International institutions, as you asked me, and as I said, have shown themselves to be poorly suited to deal with the public health and economic emergency. And, well, you have to wonder if a logic that is pro-market, pro-profit, pro-accumulation, within a severely individualistic framework, is what isn't working. And that, consequently, gives reason to think it's necessary to facilitate solidarity-based forms of international cooperation, another productive model of development that meets the expectations and needs of humanity and cares for the natural world. So far, we've discussed economic sanctions with Mark Weisbrot, and we've tackled the socioeconomic consequences of COVID-19 from a wide range of lenses with our guests, UN expert Meryl Azalawadi and Claxo scholar Julio Gambina. Our last two guests, Omar Dahi and Farad Demir, co-authors of the book South-South Trade and Finance in the 21st Century, will help us make sense of it all. Hi guys, how are you today? We're good, good. to be here with you. Yeah, glad to be here. So, before we start, let me introduce you to our listeners. Omar Dahi is the co-founder and project director of Security in Context and associate professor of economics at Hampshire College. Firat Demir is a founding member of Security in Context as well and a professor of economics at the University of Oklahoma. And having introduced our Security in Context dynamic duo, let's talk. Here comes my first question for the two of you, and feel free to jump in whoever wants to jump in first. When thinking about the socioeconomic impact of COVID and having listened to what our previous guests had to say on this matter, were there any specific themes that resonated with you? Yeah, I would say the thing that stuck out for me is that I had a chance to talk to uh, Mark Weisbrot in addition to the lecture that he gave uh, last month for Security in Context that uh, was moderated by Farat. I also had a chance to talk to him and one of the things that came across in our discussion was how we often tend to think of different uh, north-south dynamics in isolation from one another. So we tend to think of you know, the struggle within the World Trade Organization uh, that was uh, started by India and South Africa and quickly was joined by many other developing countries. Most of the uh, least developed, uh, the African group countries coalition, Many developing countries were sort of demanding a waiver and exceptions under the intellectual property rights, which is called the TRIPS uh, within uh, within the WTO, which, of course, was faced by firm rejection by the global north uh, and, of course, the big pharmaceutical industries as well in, in the Europe and in the United States. But we tend to think of that in isolation from... The other topic that Mark talked about, which is the special drawing rights struggle in the Congress, which is a basically costless, easy act that could have been easily done and handled very quickly. Of course, they're making progress there. But also, you know, we had a chance to talk about economic sanctions and other forms of economic warfare. So I think from these north-south inequalities, they're often discussed and they're often seen as somehow isolated from one another, but you see them in, in various ways interconnected, all pushing, generally pushing in, in the same direction of exacerbating these inequalities. Of course, we also shed light on some of the struggles and the success stories that are there in terms of bridging them, but still it's it's a quite an uphill battle. To add perhaps one more thing on that, and I, I completely agree with Omar, but when the pandemic hit, I think was a moment that, that is missed regarding bringing social justice to, to the discussion, given that the wires didn't care whether it was uh, impacting or different variants were developing in different countries. And instead of social justice, charity became the, the winner of the day again. Um, and most of the populations or peoples of the world ended up depending on or relying on charitable actions from the West, mostly through sharing the vaccines uh, through COVAX, which didn't work out well. And in terms of the patents and copyrights, even though all these vaccines have been developed with taxpayers' money, uh, the governments in Germany and the U.S. took most of the risk and they paid upfront for research and development of these vaccines and they purchased millions of doses ahead of before even the vaccines were invented. But they refused to waive the patents and copyrights on these vaccines 
and that created a significant shortage of vaccines that for availability for other countries. And just to give you some numbers, right? Russia, for example, made its uh, vaccine available and licensable to 34 companies outside its borders. Johnson & Johnson has only one partnership with an Indian company, and Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna have none in India, South America, or Africa. And both these companies, as well as their governments, including Germany, US, Canada, UK, and others, have refused to share or waive the licenses on this to make it available in other countries. As a result, uh, overwhelming majority of people around the world do not have access to this vaccine at all. And there's also unfairness in terms of the accessibility of a certain type of vaccine, which countries have access to which type of vaccine is highly unevenly distributed. And of course, there's gender and race, uh, but the North, South and class, I think, stands out uh, as a major factor as well. In terms of the total share of vaccine doses, if you look at around the world, less than 3% of vaccines delivered around the world as of yesterday went to Africa. And Africa is a continent has 17% of the world population and less than 3% of vaccines went. In contrast, North America, which has less than 5% of the world population, got almost 10% of the vaccines distributed. And in terms of, if you look at African continent, Burundi had 0% of the population vaccinated. DR Congo is less than 0.1%. Sudan has 0.7%. And the distribution of the vaccines, again, are not very even. Take Sinovac, which is the vaccine developed by China. 95% of Sinovac vaccines around the world went to less developed countries. Only 5% went to rich countries. In contrast, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, three quarters of that vaccine went to high-income countries. So it kind of reminds the Marianne Antoinette moment. Why are they, why are they complaining? Why can't they eat you know, cake? What are, you know, this is the same thing, why people don't get vaccinated in the rest of the world is kind of a nonsensical question because it's not accessible. And what is accessible is also highly unevenly distributed. I think it's really important to, to actually pay attention to these statistics because we tend to know and hear about these global north-south inequalities, but until we're hit with actually the vast disparity, it's, it's hard to conceptualize it. And I think... Um, one of the tools that I found particularly useful, actually. Uh, so, I mean, wh- what I like about uh, this episode, Anita, that you put together is the multi-regional focus of the socioeconomic dimensions, uh, the focus on the gendered aspect, the gender dimensions of, of the COVID response and the impact of COVID. And of course, we focused with Mark's talk and, and the discussion with him on the North-South dynamics as well. But uh, one thing I found particularly useful is that the United Nations has a tracker that you can use to track the different fiscal response and financial response by region and globally. And that, uh, you know, just to add to what Farad said, shows you the, the, the inability and the vast difference in the ability of uh, different uh, countries and regions to be able to have the fiscal space and the monetary space to respond to the economic consequences of the vaccine, so uh, of the pandemic, sorry. So it's not just simply about you know being able to have the public health response, but also the economic response. And I think the tracker that I'm referring to, which is um, uh, easily accessible if sort of someone searched online, you know, United Nations Global Stimulus Tracker, you'll see the the disparities. And one of the neat things about it is that they look at the government response and also compare that with the additional financial needs. So how much response, how much spending has been made by the governments, and then what are the additional needs if we take into account uh, sort of uh, an estimate of uh, uh, basically what we need to maintain sort of growth, what we need to maintain employment and so on. And you can see the vast difference, whereas uh, by far most of the sort of North American, European Union countries have been able to spend, you know, in, in the U.S., uh, just the fiscal response is about $5 trillion. This doesn't include the central bank response in terms of providing liquidity. Uh, in Europe, it's over $8.3 trillion, and, and the gap is minimal to the that they're able to meet their needs by, by this amount of spending, more or less. Whereas... Uh, when you look at uh, Southern Africa, when you look at uh, you know the Arab majority countries, the Arab region, uh, uh, other places, uh, South America as well, you see a huge gap. So, for example, in South America, which is you know has several middle income countries, the spending is two hundred fifty two billion, 
but the additional financial needs are 365 billion, so more than the actual spending. Whereas, uh, you know, in in other places like in in Southern Africa, the Southern African countries, there's nine billion worth of spending, and the needs are 100 billion. So, I mean, there's so many ways to see this vast amount of inequality, and I think even though the statistics can get boring at times, it's useful to remind ourselves of of how much the gap actually is. And I think just to follow up on that also. We need to understand that this is not again happening in what Kumi Omar mentioned before regarding IMF and World Bank and the global economic order. Uh, most of the developing countries went through decades of structural adjustment under IMF and World Bank programs, which significantly undermined and undercut health capabilities and fiscal capabilities of these economies. So when the pandemic hit, many of these developing countries lacked the basic ability and capability to invest in their healthcare systems and their fiscal and, and budgetary situations were also not in, in a good shape in, in, to begin with. Uh, and it in, involves decades of, again, liberalization and regulation programs. Um, and that, that also contributed and compounded the effects. There are significant research showing, for example, how IMF structural adjustment programs hurt healthcare spending and healthcare capabilities of developing countries. And we should not forget that. So when we look at developing countries and why they are hit so badly from COVID, part of it is because they were uh, they already had a sinking ship or a ship that was taking water. And now there is a storm coming in and they do not have the cap- capacity to deal with it. And the same thing applies in terms of the availability, but also the, the promises made by developing versus developed countries. In terms of the COVAX program, which was touted as a solution to bypassing um, the intellectual property rights. And, and in terms of the contextual background, I remember when many advocates and those asking for a more faster response to COVID were calling for developed countries of US, particularly UK and Germany to waive the patents on COVID vaccines. And they said, no, no, we don't have to do that. Instead, we are going to self-police ourselves and donate through charitable actions and then patting our back, we'll feel good about ourselves doing it too. But if you look at the numbers of delivery, um, take the total COVAX facility promises, 1.1 billion doses were promised by developed countries. So far, what is delivered is 211 million, which is less than 20%. Take the US, US delivered only 14% of what it promised it would deliver. Germany, less than 10%. UK, only 6% of what they promised they did deliver. So there's a need for bringing back this call for waiving the patents on vaccines, at least for now. I would like to end this discussion on a more positive note. So here is my last question. If you had to come up with suggestions, just a few, oriented towards better tackling the socioeconomic impact of COVID, what would you suggest? Uh, well, one is the importance of healthcare. I think the pandemic showed both in the North and the South, including countries like the United States that doesn't have a public healthcare system, that healthcare is a human right and viruses and sicknesses do not discriminate between rich versus poor when they hit you. In terms of numbers, I was just checking the latest numbers today. As of yesterday, Cuba is number four in the world in terms of the percentage of population with at least one shot. Cuba is one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere and is number four in terms of the size of population that is vaccinated in the world. It means it is doable, can be done, if we take healthcare as a basic human right. A second point I think I would say is we need to reprioritize our resources in, in developed countries. Um, 26% of Americans, 24% of Germans, and 20% of French say they will never get vaccinated. Then those vaccines should be, should be made available for people who are willing and ready to get vaccinated and we should put pressure on our governments to do that instead of wasting those vaccines in CVS or other pharmacies in the U.S. that people don't get vaccinated and they don't use. We should ship them over to other places instead of prioritizing booster shots. We should make them available for countries that need it now. It's not simply the fact that if they don't want to get vaccinated here, we should send those vaccines. We have the capacity to do both, to, to have you know, a positive uh, impact on, uh, on public health in the U.S., I mean, the 2022 U.S. budget, the, the House-approved budget, forecasts $10 trillion of military spending over the next decade, okay? Whereas the huge fight that's happening right now about the Biden-backed uh, bill, which is 
facing so much opposition, even some opposition within the Democratic Party, is 3.5 trillion. So there's no agreement on a 3.5 trillion uh, bill over the next decade. That's what the estimated cost would be over over the same time period. But there's basically approval of 10 trillion in military spending, and the absurdity of this. Um, you know, trillions of dollars on military spending that is happening without questioning, without debate, so taking it for granted that the continuation of militarism uh, in the U.S., for example, is is going to continue unabated when we had at the beginning of the pandemic the unavailability of masks, basically. Uh, it, you know, that, that really revealed that absurdity. Perhaps one could also add that increasing importance and realization in northern countries of importance of economic justice juxtaposed with corporate welfare, that the immense accumulation of capital in the last two years for very few people, while the rest in the United States, for example, were struggling to make the ends meet, I think it is a, it's a silver lining that it became more obvious to people that corporations that through welfare programs from the government and subsidies, including the vaccine developers, while they managed to do very well during the, during the storm, and therefore, the argument that we are all in this together, no, not really. We are not all in this together, I think, became too obvious to ignore. And the importance of economic justice, I think, is back in public discourse and debate. The fact that the founder of Amazon made $124,000 a minute last year, while Amazon didn't pay any tax at all. If you look at average tax liability of Amazon for the last five years, it's a minuscule amount compared to what I and Omar pays in the United States as our tax taxes. That I think is a silver lining. People realizing that economic justice is not charity and there is an active income redistribution from bottom to the top. And during the pandemic, it became even more serious and more obvious when millions lost their jobs. I think going forward, people will be demanding more significant changes. And the average person is a lot more progressive in the U.S. than the political class is representing them. So I think that's a promising future going forward. Thank you both so much. It was such a pleasure to talk to the two of you together. I guess now I have to read your book. That will be the last step towards being your number one fan. Um, so yeah, I'm counting on you for future episodes, just so you know. So maybe prepare something for the future. And that way I won't catch you by surprise. <laughs> Thanks, Anita. No, this was yeah, great. Let's, let's do this more often. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. You were just listening to Mark Weisbrot, Meronas Alawadi, Julio Gambina, Omar Dahi, and Firat Demir. Security in Context is a transnational research initiative focusing on peace, conflict, and international affairs. Our goal is to critically examine paradigms and practices of security and produce alternatives based on collaborative research. If you want to keep up to date with our latest news, publications, and events, you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. We'll be back with more in the next episode of the Security in Context podcast. Until then, stay tuned.